Hey, this is Lee Wright uh, from near Boston. I'm the founder of History Camp and with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund, the director of The Pursuit of History. Welcome, we are so glad you're joining us tonight. And we have with us tonight, Lorna Hainsworth. She refers to herself as an ambassador and national traveler. So she has attended and presented at multiple history camps in Boston, Colorado, and Virginia. And she is also a major sponsor of the Pursuit of History. And we are excited to have her with us tonight. So Lorna, let's start with why you call yourself an ambassador and national traveler. Thanks, Carrie. In the description that is on the History Camp webpage and also that is on the History Camp Facebook page, there is a description of me that includes a list of the organizations to which I belong. Whenever I'm given the least opportunity, I will tell anybody who will listen to me how great these organizations are, what they do, why they're important, why they should be supported. And as a consequence, I think of myself as an ambassador for these organizations. Now, as far as a national traveler is concerned, quite frankly, I will go anywhere in the United States or Canada to learn about history, to attend lectures, to go on tours, to uh, go to conferences, or to present one of the several presentations that I give. Whenever I travel, I always travel by vehicle, and I go around in either my car or one of my two pickup trucks. So that's why I call myself an ambassador and national traveler. That sounds great. I think traveling around learning about history is a good goal in life. All right, so let's get into the meat of our topic tonight. Tell us about Historic National Road. Okay, I'm going to tell the story of the Historic National Road by discussing three major aspects regarding the road. I'm going to talk about its origin, I'll talk about its evolution, and then I'll talk about its status. But first of all, I'd like to make sure that you understand why this road is important and what makes it unique. The road is important because it is the road that built America. It is the road that began in Cumberland, Maryland and eventually stretched all the way from the Inner Harbor in Baltimore across the AIDS Bridge, which goes over the Mississippi River into St. Louis, Missouri. It is the road that tied the Northwest Territory to the Eastern Seaboard. It is the road that linked six of our states. These are Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. That makes a total of 824 miles. Now, what makes this road unique is that it is our first federally funded road and it is our nation's first interstate. The origin of this road goes all the way back to prehistory. You see, for eons, there always was travel across the Allegheny Mountains from the Potomac River to the Ohio River. For that, we can thank bison. And yes, there were bison uh, in the eastern portion of the country at one time. These bison and other game animals would make traces or trails and they would go across the mountains. Subsequently, native people started to use these traces as footpaths. And they could use these as footpaths to travel, uh, to trade with one another, uh, to use as portages. Now, after a while, when Europeans showed up, they would trade with the Indians. And so these traders would also use these footpaths, but because a lot of times they carried their supplies and their materials on wagons, they widened these footpaths to make them wide enough for wagons to go on. So now we're gonna go to the start of the French and Indian War. You may recall that George Washington was sent on a diplomatic mission in 1753. He went to an area that is in today's Northwestern Pennsylvania. 
and he was to tell the French that were there that this was British claimed land and that they should leave. Well, of course they didn't. Then the following year in 1754, he was again sent to the same basic area. And what he was told to do then was to build a military road and to build a fort. Well, an unfortunate incident happened during this mission, and that is called the Jumanville Incident. And this involved George Washington and his soldiers and his Indian allies attacking a group of French soldiers, among which was a French diplomat. Many of the French soldiers and the diplomat were killed. This led immediately uh, following to the Battle of Fort Necessity. And quite frankly, this is given credit for starting the French and Indian War, which morphed into the Seven Years' War. So now let's go to what happened following that at General Edward Braddock was sent over to America to build a road from Alexandria to Virginia to what was then called Fort Duquesne. This was a French fort at the Forks of the Ohio. And he was gonna build this military road and take a whole bunch of soldiers and stuff like that and go up there and force the French to leave. Well. We know that that was not a very successful campaign either because General Braddock was killed in a very short distance from his final destination. Fort Duquesne today, of course, is modern day Pittsburgh. So we'll leave that for a moment and go to just after the Revolutionary War. This takes us to the year of 1784. In the Treaty of Paris, the United States had acquired the Northwest Territory. And when I say the Northwest Territory, I mean that chunk of land that is north of the Ohio River, west of the Allegheny Mountains, east of the Mississippi River, and south of the Great Lakes. Now, many settlers had already been moving into this area. They had found ways to get across the Allegheny Mountains and across the Appalachian Mountains, and they were settling in all kinds of places like you know, Ohio country and Kentucky and one thing or another. And so the thing is, is that uh, a lot of people had gone across. And so George Washington, because of his travels in that area previously, he had acquired a certain amount of land. So he decided in 1784, he would go out and take a look to see what was going on. And of course he was none too pleased with the fact that he found squatters and all kinds of stuff on his land. But what really disturbed him was the Western settlers as a group. He was concerned that these people didn't feel any kind of allegiance or kinship or attachment to the United States. As a matter of fact, I wanna quote what George had to say about the Western settlers. He said, they stand upon a pivot the touch of a feather could turn them any way. What he means by that is that instead of feeling they're part of the United States, these people could easily turn their faces west and feel like they were more of a part of, of Spain because there were Spanish people on the west side of the Mississippi or again become aligned with Great Britain because there were English uh, around the Great Lakes area. So he was very concerned about this and he said, what we've got to do is we've got to build a road that goes from the Potomac River to the Ohio River and crosses over the Allegheny Mountains. He said, and I'll quote, open a wide door, make a smooth way. That way they could transport all the resources that were available west of the mountains eastward and vice versa, they could make manufactured goods come from the east to the west. Also, he felt that by having a road that would tie east and west together, it could prevent a split in the country, which would basically split right along the range of the mountains. The beginnings of the National Road go back to when George Washington paid his visit in 1784, because while he was out there, he got a bunch of locals together and he had what I, I like to call it a town meeting basically to ask them, do you think we can build a road across the Allegheny Mountains? 
And one of the people that attended that meeting was a guy named Albert Gallatin. Now Gallatin owned property in southwestern Pennsylvania. He had a home there that he called Friendship Hill. And of course, it would be to his advantage to have a major road near his home. So he said to George, of course, we can build a road across the Allegheny Mountains. Now, when Albert Gallatin became Secretary of the Treasury under Jefferson, he did a report. And this report is called the Report on the Sinking Fund. This report eventually became part of an act that was passed in 1802. And this act allowed for, er, enabled Ohio to become a state. And also it provided a methodology for funding internal improvements, such as canals, bridges, roads, the drinking of harbor, harbors. Now, because Albert Gallatin had proposed a means of funding a national road, he earned the title of father of the national road. So there was legislation. And this legislation said that a road would be built from Cumberland in Maryland to the state of Ohio, because Ohio became a state in 1803. There was some concern, however, whether or not this legislation was constitutional, because those people who believed in the strict construction of the Constitution will say, if it doesn't say the federal government can do it, then they can't do it. And then there are the liberal constructionists who will say, well, only if it says the federal government can't do it, then it can do it. And so there was an argument about whether or not this, and Jefferson himself was concerned about this. He thought maybe there should be an amendment or something like that to, uh, to pass this legislation. Gallatin, on the other hand, had discussions with him and basically pointed out to him the powers of Congress. These are in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and it says that Congress is to provide for the common defense and the general welfare. It is also to regulate commerce. Gallatin is arguing that if you can't get to the people, you can't defend them. If you cannot look out for their general welfare, if there's no access to it, you cannot regulate commerce if you can't get to where the commerce is occurring. So he says, this makes it something that is provided for in the constitution. And in addition to that, in that same section, it talks about the fact that Congress is responsible for establishing post offices and post roads. Gallatin basically is saying a road is a road. Yeah, maybe it's designed to carry mail, but it can also be used for trade, transport, and travel. Well, anyway, despite his misgivings, Jefferson did sign this legislation on March 29th of 1806. So now let's look. We've got the legislation. Let's see how the road evolved. First of all, the legislation says a road from Cumberland to Ohio. That's basically through Wheeling. The survey for that road took from 1806 to 1811. Then the construction of the road itself took from 1811 until 1818. Part of the reason why it took this long is because the legislation had very specific requirements for the road. It was supposed to be as straight and short as possible. It was supposed to have a width of 66 feet with a 20 foot roadbed that was absolutely free of all obstacles, including stumps from trees. The surface of this 20 foot section was to be all weather. That means it's not supposed to be dusty in dry weather and it's not supposed to be muddy in wet weather. The surface of the road was regulated in terms of how steep it could be, whether it was going uphill or going downhill. The grade of the road was dictated in the legislation and also they were to place markers at every mile. And if there was going to be a sharp turn, there was a marker to be placed just prior to that sharp turn as well. In building the road from Cumberland to Wheeling, portions of the road that Braddock back in the 1750s was also incorporated into the national road. 
So we've got a road that starts in Cumberland. However, its eastern terminus is Baltimore. And the reason for that is about the same time the National Road was being built, there were a series of turnpikes that were being created that went between Baltimore and Cumberland. These were privately funded turnpikes. A series of them were put together that met the same standards as were required by the legislation of the National Road. As a matter of fact, a year ago, March, at the Boston History Camp in March 19, in 2019, I gave a talk on this road. It became known as the National Pike. And so what we've got now is we've got a road that goes all the way from Baltimore to Wheeling, a total of 280 miles, and we've got the Baltimore uh, excuse me, the National Pike from Baltimore to Cumberland, and we've got the National Road from Cumberland to Wheeling. Now, the road doesn't stop there. It gets to Wheeling, but it doesn't stop there. And the reason why is because there's legislation in 1825 that extends the road. Now, what I think is kind of interesting here is that Jefferson signed the original legislation. The two presidents after him were his good buddies, James Madison and James Monroe, they both had opportunities to sign legislation that really would have extended the national road, but they didn't think it was constitutional to do that. However, when John Quincy Adams becomes president, he gets to be president starting in March of 1825. And by July of 1825, he has signed legislation to extend the national road. One thing I'll say about John Quincy Adams, he was a real advocate of internal improvements. So the road goes from Wheeling to Zanesville and it gets there by 1830. And it goes from Zanesville to Columbus by 1833 and from Columbus to Springfield by 1838. That's where it sort of basically stopped. So in Ohio, the people who live in Eaton, Ohio and Dayton, Ohio are saying, well, you know, Aren't we going to get the National Road? Isn't it coming through here? There'd been a survey in 1833 as to where the National Road would go. <clears throat> and that survey indicated that it would go straight from Springfield to Richmond, Indiana, a straight line. But the people who lived in Eaton and Dayton said, no, 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 no. We want the National Road to come to us. Andrew Jackson made the decision that the road would not go through Eaton and Dayton that it would go straight from Springfield to Richmond. Had it gone through those two towns, it would have only added another four miles to the road. So what these folks did in Eaton and Dayton, they said, okay, we'll make our own road. And they created a couple of turnpike companies and they made a road that went from Springfield to Eaton to Dayton to Richmond. It was a higher quality road. It served more traffic. And they even put up mile markers that sort of made it look like it was the national road or sort of an extra legal road. So at any rate, the, um, that, that road that went to Dayton was referred to as the Dayton Cutoff. Now, because of the 1825 legislation, the national road was also begun to be built in Indianapolis. And that was in 1828. Now in Indianapolis, what they did is, because Indianapolis, you may uh, uh, recall, is like in the center of the state. So what they did is they built in an east-west direction simultaneously. And then during the period 1834 to 1850, the road was completed from Richmond through Indianapolis and on to Terre Haute. Now in Illinois, Vandalia was the capital at the time. and um, in 1839, they were able to complete a right of way from the eastern boundary of the um, state of Illinois all the way to the capital of Vandalia. However, the federal government ceased funding the road in 1842. After the federal government has spent 600, excuse me, 6.2 eight million dollars they said that's it no more we're, not, we're, we're out of the road building business and so the state of illinois had to finish the road from vandalia to the mississippi river and that was completed by 1850. you may notice that 
the Rhodes is starting to develop a pattern here in that it's going through state capitals. It goes through Columbus, it goes through Indianapolis, it goes to Vandalia, which was the capital at the time. During this period also, the federal government makes a decision that although they weren't absolutely certain they should be in the business of building roads, that was that federal responsibility or should that be something that the states do or private investors do, they were absolutely convinced they were not in the business of state, excuse me, of road maintenance. And so they turned the maintenance of the road over to the states. Well, as soon as the states became responsible for the road, they set up toll houses and they charged people to use the road. When it was under federal jurisdiction, it was a free road. As soon as it came under state jurisdiction, it was a road you had to pay to use. So now we're gonna take a look at the status of the road. The National Road enjoyed a period of time that is known as its heyday. That period goes from 1825 to 1850. It was incredible. It was so heavily trafficked that sometimes there was traffic round the clock. There were huge numbers of stagecoaches that were passing along the road. As a result of that, a lot of taverns and inns started being uh, created along the road. Sometimes they were as close as 12 miles apart. There was a tremendous amount of raw material being brought from the West to the East Coast to be used in manufacture. There was a lot of manufactured material coming from the East Coast to the West. There were travelers, there are, there are journals of people who just like we do today. They went out sightseeing. They wanted to see what there was to see, so they traveled along the road. A number of settlers who were moving from the eastern area to the western area used the National Road to travel to their new home. There was also a tremendous amount of livestock being moved along the road. There would be herds of sheep, goats, hogs, even geese. Can you imagine herding geese? At any rate, so the road has this really incredible time. It is extremely well used and extremely popular. And then it suffers its first decline. The rationale that's given for why the road declined after 1850 is because A, no federal funding, B, poor state, state maintenance. States weren't really keeping the road up to the standards that they should but most important was the advent of the railroad. The first stone was laid for the B&O Railroad on July 4th, 1828. By 1842, the B&O Railroad was in Cumberland, Maryland. And by 1853, it was in Wheeling. There were people who believed at the time that if you had a railroad, you didn't need a road. However, there was a resurgence and this resurgence happened in the late 1800s. And what brought this resurgence on was the bicycle craze. This was the time when in this country, people went absolutely mad for bicycles. People would ride around towns on their bicycles and then they said, you know, it would be nice to ride out in the country, but the roads in the countryside were just terrible. So they started demanding that the federal government do something to improve the roads. This is the time when the League of American Wheelmen was started. And as a matter of fact, that organization still exists today. They've been going now for about 140 years. They were aided by the fact that what came on the scene now is the automobile. And as you know, Americans love their cars. And so people fell in love with the automobile and they demanded good roads so that they could drive their cars. So combination of the bicycles and the cars and stuff like that, the federal government finally issued some additional legislation as far as road construction is concerned, but this was not just that they're gonna build roads. It was, a, it was a deal where they would go 50-50 with the states and they would tell the states that, um, okay, you got a plan for how you're gonna build this road and you've got half the money 
And if that's the case and your plan is approved, we will give you the other half. And so this was the 1916 Federal Road Aid Act. And um, if you do the math, you'll see that from 1825 to 1916 is almost 100 years before the um, federal government passed additional legislation regarding the building of roads. The second decline came when the United States uh, came up with the US highway system. That was in 1926, and that was followed 30 years later by the interstate highway system. So what happened with these two highway systems is they basically started um, bypassing towns, creating new roads. Uh, this was a time when they had the kind of equipment necessary to do cut and fill so you could lower hills and fill in valleys and make the roads straight and smooth. And um, so the, the thing is, is that people did not travel these old roads anymore because they had better, newer roads. And so the road pretty much fell into disuse. But let's take a look at what we've got today. First of all, in 2002, the Federal Highway Administration presented the honor to the historic national road of being an all-American road, which is the highest honor they can convey. The road is still out there. It is still possible to travel it. You just have to go find it. And the way you can find it, first of all, you can Google, do a Google search on America's byways. You can contact the tourism departments in the six states that I mentioned that the national road goes through. You can contact the museums, visitor centers, and interpretive centers that are along the road and get information then you can put together your own trip along the National Road. As far as I'm concerned, it's like an outdoor museum. There, there's signage to help you along the way. There are interpretive signs. There are mile markers. There's a whole lot of mile markers in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and they're, they're really great to see. Uh, there are monuments. There's some fabulous old toll houses that are still there, some incredible bridges. For example, the Y Bridge that's in Zanesville and the suspension bridge that's in Wheeling. So I would like to encourage everybody, get out there and enjoy the National Road. And may you find a wide open door and a smooth way. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lorna. That sounds fantastic. I think Lee has some questions that have come in for you. <laughs> well, I do. And uh, the, the, the first question is from uh, Larissa, who wants to know how she can get that fabulous National Road t-shirt that you've got, Lorna. <laughs> this was a special order that I, I had to send a logo into a t-shirt company and they <laughs> put it on the shirt and sent it back to me. I don't even remember what the company is anymore, but, but that's how I got it. Do you know what? I know somebody who might be able to make another one of those. Oh, do you now? <laughs> then I, I will, we'll have to talk about that afterwards. Um, so, Lorna, another question. You mentioned that the, there are lots of specifications for uh, the quality of the road, the, uh, the slopes, so on and so forth. Who, what was the road actually constructed of? The road was really crushed stone, pretty much. Um, a lot of people will say it was macadam, but that's not really true because the first macadam road in this country was actually between Hagerstown and Boonesboro, which is part of the National Pike. But they would, they would have crushed stone. The difference between a macadam and a regular crushed stone road is a macadam is done in layers and, and the other roads weren't. And that's what makes the difference because the, it's like a, a, a coarse layer followed by a medium grade layer, followed by a small layer, and then it would all compact together. But these were uh, pretty much crushed stone uh, in order to make uh, the, the road. So the surface was durable, if you will. Sure, sure. So, and, and then a related question, who, actually, who did the actual construction? Was that contracted with local companies? 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's a guy named David Schreiber. Um, and um, in some of the books, you'll see that he is advertising. In other words, he's, he's going to be in charge of the construction, but he's advertising for workmen. And he needs you know, various different kinds of workmen. They, they tried all sorts of, of things, but uh, eventually what happens, and, and I didn't mention this, uh, but as the road starts moving into places like Ohio and Indiana, it really became a part of the uh, Corps of Engineers responsibility. And so, you know, however they go about, you know, building roads, that it was their responsibility. So, so it was like, you know, it was contracted um, to, uh, to build. Got it, got it. So two other questions, and then I think we're going to talk for just a minute about another road trip, this one on August 1st, and it's called America's Summer Road Trip. All right, Lorna, so you mentioned some of the highlights on the America's National Road and also that you love to travel. And we love the fact that you uh, have, have gone uh, to Colorado, have gone have come up to Boston and so forth and presented at our history camps. What's one or two of your uh, most kind of cherished memories of your road trips, whether or not it's on the National Road or elsewhere? Well, I'll tell you, I spent three and a half months following the Lewis and Clark Trail. And I cannot tell you how many, I don't know, call them coincidences, call them serendipities, call them inexplicable occasions, whatever you want to call them. But I had so many times when something would happen that I didn't plan for and it was extraordinary. So when I wrote an account of my trip, I titled it Road Spirit River because I truly believe that in as much as Lewis and Clark were on the river and they were being guided by the river spirit, I was being guided by the road spirit. And to this day, you might think I'm a little weird, but to this day, that's who I believe in. When I am in a serious situation, I say, oh, come on now, road spirit, hang in there with me. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is wonderful. Uh, so from, from the general to the very specific for a second, uh, one, uh, one viewer is asking, um, is, uh, does I-70, roughly follow the National Road? Okay, one of the things I'd like to clarify right away, the National Road is the National Road. Now it got overlaid in some areas by US 40, and then US 40 got overlaid by I-70, and in other instances in Maryland got overlaid by I-68. So the thing is, is that it parallels in some instances, it overlays in other instances, but the truth of the matter is when somebody says, oh, I know the National Road, that's US 40. I say, no, 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 that's not the National Road. The National Road is the National Road, whether it's underneath another road or it's out there by itself. Well, that, that is great. So Lorna, I, I'm, I'm sure that no one knows more about these than, than, than you do. And I wanna just remind people who are watching that Lorna is one of, many fascinating speakers we have at History Camp every year. Uh, when I founded History Camp, uh, one, of my, one of my goals was to provide a forum for fascinating people who know so much about a topic to connect with others who are interested in learning about it. So uh, check out more on History Camp back when we can, uh, or excuse me, looking ahead to when we can do it in um, the form we love most, which is uh, uh, in, uh, in lecture halls and, and uh, uh, being able to uh, meet face to face. Uh, so, Lorna, this was, this was great. Now, I'm going to mention for just a minute uh, something coming up on August 1. Now, it's called America's Summer Road Trip. And <clears throat> we're going to go from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and have a live broadcast from 12 historic sites across the country. It, they cover a wide range of uh, geographies, time periods, and subjects, and this to us is, is just so interesting. We've been working hard on it. Uh, it is a project of the Pursuit of History, uh, which is also the organization behind History Camp. And Lorna, by the way, is a huge supporter of uh, History Camp and the Pursuit of History. So Lorna, thanks again. This is great. And then let's look ahead to next week, June 25, uh, Ted Widmere 
who uh, has a really interesting book out called Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, and it covers Washington's uh, travel by rail to, uh, to, to uh, assume the presidency. So uh, that's next Thursday, and then mark your calendars for August 1. We'll have more details at americasummerroadtrip.org, and there you can also uh, sign up for alerts and so forth. Uh, we're going to be announcing, like I said, in just a couple of days, some of the sites. So this is wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. We'll see you next week. Good night. Bye.